Canada and the UAE from our Canadian Business Council here in Dubai and Northern Emirates. We're looking forward to a very exciting um, a webinar today because there are some extremely exchanging, uh, exchanging skylines due to many factors. So today you'll have many experts who'll be able to help you with those uh, those ideas and how what how to move forward. If you have any questions at all, please put them up in the Q and A right away whenever you feel free, and we will we will be putting them in accordingly. Uh, we have Sharam who will be taking on the session today. So uh, may I pass it over to you? Just a reminder: this re session will be recorded. So we hope to have it up on our YouTube channel very soon. Thanks a lot. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Diana, and welcome to everyone. Welcome to uh, this uh, seminar on the latest real estate trends in Canada and the UAE. I'm Shahram Safai. I'm the chairman of the Canadian Business Council for Dubai and Northern Emirates. I'm a partner and the head of real estate in the law firm of Afridi and Angel in Dubai. Uh, I'm excited to welcome you to our event where we'll be exploring the latest trends in real estate uh, in Canada, as well as in the United Arab Emirates. It's my honor to be your host this evening, bringing not only the panel's deep passion and experience uh, in real estate, but also a commitment to uncovering the insights propelling the industry forward. Today, we're honored to have three distinguished speakers who will share their insights and experience with you on current real estate trends. Uh, we have Mr. Sadiq uh, Farid, who uh, will be talking, as well as Mr. Scott Nazareth and Mr. Wayne Bewick. So uh, that is, and we'll, we'll uh, go through their presentations in that order uh, and the Q&A and feel free at any time to ask questions. And I'll try and field those questions live as we're going through. Now, having closely observed the market dynamics in both Canada and the UAE, being involved in real estate practice, in Dubai for about 20 years, and of course, prior to that, in Canada as an investor, um, it's important that uh, the trends uh, are understood when you're making investment decisions. That, that's really what this is about. So interest rates, uh, post-COVID effects, the economy, geopolitics, all these can have an effect on real estate. The real estate sector is not just about buying and selling properties. It is a reflection of economic health social dynamics and global trends. In today's globalized world, the choices we make in real estate investments are more critical than ever. The ability to adapt to emerging trends, seize opportunities, and navigate regulatory landscapes to find success in the ever-evolving real estate industry. So with that, and without uh, further delay, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our first panelist, uh, Mr. Sadiq Farid. Uh, Mr. Sadiq Farid, uh, was uh, born in Saudi. Uh, he grew up in Canada. He's a CPA, CA, CFA, CEO, and founder of Smart Crowd. Um, Sadiq is a seasoned corporate finance executive with over 11 years of board-based experience in a variety of sectors, including at the big four in Canada, Qatar, and UAE. He's a chartered accountant, as well as CFA charter holder. Sadiq is the founder of Smart Crowd, the region's first regulated digital real estate investment platform, his experience includes, but is not limited to M&A, business valuations, asset management, investor relationships, fundraising, and equity investments. Sadiq, welcome. Is that me? <laughs> yes. Oh, that's quite the introduction. Thanks. Uh, appreciate that. Pleasure. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining this evening. Uh, we got a small group over here, so I would love to get a sense. I don't know if they can speak or not. I don't think they can. But I wanted to get a sense of how many people are from UAE and how many people are from 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 Canada, just to uh, contextualize some of the, the things that I want to talk about today. There's no presentation, so just about me talking. And feel free to um, put Q, uh, questions in the Q and A chat as I'm speaking. I'll try to address them as much as possible in the in the time that I have. But just to give you a little bit of background and to contextualize uh, uh, my presentation over here, and I, I echo uh, Sharam's uh, sentiment. Um, you know, trends are very important uh, uh, and understanding them so you can allocate your capital appropriately in any sort of investments, whether it's real estate or any other asset uh, class. Um, my journey in investment started very early on. Um, um, you know, Ottawa is home for me. I went to University of Ottawa. I started my real estate experience, investing experience when I was in university. 
Um, you know, this was, I don't want to age myself over here, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll give it away anyways. This is around 2000, 2003 time where I was able to convince my parents uh, that, hey, I'm wasting too much money on rent. Um, give me some money and uh, I'll put a down payment and buy a house uh, or a condo rather, um, which they did. And then, you know, my mom has sold the business. Long story short, I convinced her, hey, let me get a two bedroom one. I can rent the second bedroom or let me get a parking spot, right? And purely because I'm a finance student. So it was just purely a numbers game for me. And that's how the journey started. Um, one day I was walking back from, from campus, uh, saw an open house sign, uh, walked into the house and it was right across the campus. And I was like, this will be a great place to rent. And that's how the journey started. Um, I was, uh, had not, had never done any real estate investment experience, et cetera, and so forth. Call a bunch of brokers just to go see the place. Um, uh, waived a whole bunch of financial conditions, trying to convince the bank, you know, give this 20 year old co-op student some money um, on purely a rental income and co-op salary to essentially, you know, get leverage and, and have two properties and so forth. Uh, other than learning a few things about real estate experience, I had a great four years of university because of that as well, too. But uh, but that's, that's how sort of the passion uh, started purely investing. I was always a capital markets enthusiast, um, uh, given my uh, interest while I was studying and, you know, pursuing getting a chartered accountancy um, out of university and then uh, uh, pursuing a CFA charter holder. I moved to the region. Uh, here in 2011, I spent three years in Doha in the last 10 years or so in, 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 in UAE. And about four, five years ago, I decided to uh, stop being a job seeker and become a job creator. Uh, always had you know passion to um, uh, uh, become an entrepreneur. I had many ideas only to find other people, pursue them and make businesses out of it. And so I, I try to combine you know what I'm really passionate about, which is investing, um, and educating, uh, sharing experiences uh, uh, and uh, my uh, technical skills to form a company called Smart Crowd. So, you know, Smart Crowd is, is, is effectively a digital platform that is unlocking uh, people's ability to invest beyond the traditional um, asset classes like stocks and bonds. Uh, many people want to invest in real estate, but struggle to do so mainly due to large capital requirements inability to source deals and having the expertise to evaluate them appropriately. So we solve all those challenges by offering a digital solution where you can invest as little as, you know, 500 dirhams or 100, 100 or $150, uh, so to speak, uh, own a fraction of the asset and benefit from the returns generated for, uh, from it. And the reason for that is, you know, uh, having hard assets, alternative assets like direct real estate in one's investment portfolio is critical because what it does, it, it lowers the overall risk of the portfolio and it enhances return. So you, you generate more return for every level of risk that you have in your portfolio. So if you look at the wealthy, the, the, way, the way they're able to um, not only grow, but preserve their capital and grow their capital is by having a massive allocation or a significant allocation in, in hard assets like real estate that provide them rental income that allows them to take on more risk and grow their capital and so forth. But the average person does not have that ability because they don't have sufficient capital to have proper diversification. By fractionalizing the asset class, um, people are able to do so. So that's how the journey started. The way it's in, like a perfect place to do so, given its, 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 its appeal, not only for domestic activity, but a lot of foreign investor capital that comes in. So we've been operational since COVID and, uh, and, you know, and exciting times, right? You would think starting a business in, in, in COVID would have been, you know, uh, suicidal, but actually it was a blessing. And, uh, and, and the government over here has done a phenomenal job, uh, did a phenomenal job in terms of, um, you know, managing that, uh, that pandemic. And, and post that, you know, this place has transformed um, completely. Uh, I'm sure you know a lot of the people, panelists who who have lived here for a long time, or have visited this place would would, would agree uh, on that sentiment that uh, it it has become uh, uh, transformative. And and what's amazing is, you know, we as a business, you know, we're very data centric uh, focused people, and and we already saw the trends coming, and COVID just accelerated um, many of these elements uh, because the government is very progressive over here. 
there were already structural reforms taking place in terms of uh, residency, ownership, um, uh, business ownership, et cetera. And now we're starting to see the fruits of that labor uh, and so forth with massive population increase and demographic shifts uh, that is causing a very positive momentum uh, in the real estate market, which in my opinion is here to stay for the long term. So let's talk about some of these elements that has really transformed in Dubai. So historically, when you look at Dubai, the way real estate market is relatively nascent, new, right? Uh, the, the, the foreign ownership laws uh, were introduced in 2002. Uh, and that's when uh, non-locals or non-Emiratis were able to buy real estate in designated areas um, in, in, in Dubai. So, you know, uh, the Dubai real estate market is effectively 20 years old. So not, you know, not a lot. And, and it's gone through two cycles um, already in a very short period of time, three cycles, actually. Um, um, sort of two peaks and two troughs uh, uh, within that uh, time frame. And uh, historically, it's been a very uh, investor-focused driven market. Um, and you also have to understand the population um, of, uh, of, of Dubai. So for the last 20 years, you know, Dubai is, has attracted a lot of people, obviously, expats and so forth. But a big chunk of that population has been labor uh, because this, the city, the country need to be developed. Um, it's a lot of infrastructure projects, a lot of big real estate mega projects and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, 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 some statistics would prove uh, state that about 30% of the population were labor and, and labor population adds very little economic value uh, to Dubai because uh, most of them are low earners and most of the capital, you know, or their earnings go back home, gets remitted back home. They don't necessarily um, uh, add a lot of economic value uh, to, to the economy. Uh, but that has shifted uh, because the country now is pretty much built, the infrastructure is built. There's still a lot of construction going on but not at the scale that was needed back um, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And what that has done is now the shift has been into more sort of uh, white collar labor um, coming in, more skilled labor, uh, what you call the gig economy, uh, the digital nomads. Uh, so the demographic has, has, uh, has changed drastically. Uh, and these people add a lot of economic value um, uh, to the economy. These people also need housing, et cetera, and so forth. So demand has risen rapidly compared to supply because it's not it's not very easy for you to construct a new building uh, it takes a lot of time and with covid the supply chain restrictions and so forth the cost of uh, material cost of construction has also risen so the floor has risen uh, as well too and, and and these sort of supply demand pressures will continue uh, uh, to to prevail uh, for for many years to come as the population continues to grow uh, you know dubai has very ambitious plans uh, in terms of making this a world-class city, it already is a world-class city, um, and, and it's looking to double its population um, in, in the next two decades, uh, and that would require a lot of housing, and you know, there's only so much you can build. A lot of people say, oh, it's a desert, you know, there's a lot of land available to, to build, um, but it's not that easy to, to, to build in the desert. The infrastructure is not that easy to build in the desert. As you'll notice, the way it's mainly built around the coast a lot of re uh, reclaimed land as well too and so forth because going into the desert is very, very difficult and more costly to build. So yeah, supply will continue to come, but it's being absorbed by the demand that is coming in. And right now the demand is outpacing supply. Hence, we're seeing a very positive momentum uh, in the real estate market over the last um, two years and so forth, where we've seen the longest um, you know, month on month price increases uh, ever witnessed, uh, record transactions and so forth. Um, and 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 in the long term, these trends tend, uh, uh, given given what we're seeing in the economy, uh, the government's um, uh, uh, support uh, uh, in terms of uh, fiscal stimulus, uh, it is very positive to continue to attract. The other elements that make it very, very attractive for people to come and set up base over here is if you look at from a regional perspective, it is considered a safe haven not only for capital, but also for from a, from a safety lifestyle health perspective. So, you you know, we've seen, I think, second or third uh, most mi migration of millionaires into Dubai. I think uh, only um, uh, Dubai was, I think, second or third to Australia. And I can't think of um, what other country attracted more millionaires over the last two years. Um, and, and that is because a lot, of, uh, a lot of people in the surrounding areas, a lot of wealthy people, um, they prefer the lifestyle of Dubai. Dubai has a lifestyle, in my opinion, second to none, vis-a-vis uh, -vis any other metropolitan city. And the cost of it compared to any other big city is still very marginal. It is expensive. Dubai is not cheap. 
but when you compare it to other metropolitan big cities, it is relatively uh, uh, cheap, uh, especially when you look at real estate from a price per square foot perspective. So that's attracted a lot of uh, a lot of wealthy people that are moving over here, living over here, setting their base over here, but continuing their businesses back home, etc. Because the beauty of Dubai is within six hours of a flight, you can cover 80% of the landmass. Um, you can you can be anywhere in the world within six hour flight. 80% uh, of the places in the world, right? Which makes it a very significant strategic hub. Um, so a lot of business people come over here and that's also now attracting not only digital nomads, but a lot of executive nomads as well too, with this whole uh, concept of work from anywhere, work from home sort of concept. And that's also benefiting places like Dubai because people can, can just come park over here, enjoy a great lifestyle and continue to service whether they're businesses or their employers from here. And the other beautiful, beautiful thing is being in Dubai, you can cater to the East from a time zone uh, different perspective, uh, from a time zone perspective, as well as the West um, in, a, in a very accommodative manner. Um, so it makes it a very, uh, a very strategic place for a lot of these digital nomads, executive nomads to be based over here. That is also having a lot of momentum. And then the government has introduced a lot of freelancer visas, digital nomad visas, uh, easy to get long-term residency. Um, you can set up businesses over here relatively quickly um, and so forth. And that is uh, obviously attracting a lot of entrepreneurs, creating jobs and has a lot of positive momentum. I've been here for 11 years. Uh, I haven't seen the city busier than it is right now. Uh, you know, I actually hate leaving my house because of the traffic, right? It's a nuisance right now. It's growing pains. Right. But as a business, especially the business that I'm in, it's, it's fantastic because we obviously benefit from that. But as, as, a, as, a, as a resident of the city, it is very painful. <laughs> right. And I, I can hear some, you know, some nods, et cetera, and so forth. And, and these are these are not, I would say, fads. Right? These are, you know, real, tangible um, uh, uh, reforms that have taken place that is making this place extremely attractive. It's the, one of the safest cities, countries in the world. Uh, I, uh, I don't know how many of you guys are actually ever been to Dubai and so forth. I can give you a lot of examples of things that I would never think of doing anywhere else in the world where I can do in Dubai, right? Like, like uh, I'll give you an example. My, my battery on my car key has been down. I haven't locked my car for like four months, right? I, I, I just, I can't, I, I don't want, I can't be bothered going and replacing the battery because it's not working. It's, I don't have to worry about that. And my mom just came from Toronto and she's like, the amount of car thefts in Toronto have just skyrocketed. And I couldn't, I couldn't phantom that, right? Um, uh, but so, uh, you know, I'm gonna stop there. There's probably a lot of questions. Sure. Um, but so, Sadiq, any, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, thank you so much. So, so very insightful and, and what an amazing, uh, amazing business uh, life you've had and experience starting as a, as a student and then growing and having this uh, smart crowd, which of course, we all know very well. Congratulations to you. And thank you for sharing all your uh, experiences with us. Um, let me ask a question which uh, may be on the mind of the audience. And I would encourage the audience to ask any questions they want as well. But, you know, the Dubai market has skyrocketed over the past two years. Uh, the prices are, especially in the luxury segment, astronomical compared to what they used to be. Um, from your perspective, and I do realize that, you know, it's your business and you have a certain position, but objectively, how much of that is speculation? How much of that is demand? What do you see out there? Uh, fantastic question. I guess it's asked a lot, right? So think with a grain of salt, a little bit of biasness in, in here, right? So, you know, there's speculation in every single market, right? Like even if you look at the Canadian market, there's been speculation. I've been wrong about the Canadian market, right? I've been calling for a crash for the last decade, right? <laughs> uh, it's coming finally. God will probably Me have too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? So I'll, I'll tell you why I don't think that this is not as speculative driven because there's a question raised about, you know, there's been three dips in the market over the last 20 years and so forth. So, uh, you know, it's an emerging market. Right. There used to be a frontier market. It's an emerging market. It's a maturing market. So you, 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 you naturally will have more volatility in that space. I'll give you examples. In the past, uh, there was a lot more speculation bubbles, et cetera, especially leading up to the 2008 global financial crisis in 2009. You know, there was very little rules and regulations at that point in time. Uh, you know, Dubai was trying, still trying to figure things out. So there was a lot of you know, horror stories where people made a lot of money, but a lot of people lost a lot of money as well too, right? We always talk about you know, how many people lost money, but we don't talk about how many people made lots of money, right? There's people that I know they made 
ridiculous amount of money and they're still living off of that as well too. But the cycles were much shorter as well too because they're quite volatile. Cycles are getting longer, which is a sign of maturity. That's one element. Second element is mortgage transactions are all time high, right? Which means these are end users that are finally saying, hey, I'm committed to living over here. I've been living over here paying rent. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm ready to buy and make a commitment, long-term commitment to the city, mm. right? And that's another trend that I didn't talk about. That's a big trend. You know, this used, this, the way it used to be a very transient um, uh, city where people be in and out. I know so many people over the last two or three years, uh, especially like they came here in COVID, they got, they got stuck and they, they haven't left. They're like, this is a great place to raise family. It's a safe place. Uh, it has very little social issues, uh, et cetera. So it's becoming less transient. People are staying here longer. And that's that's encouraging people to anchor down and and, and buy property. So mortgage transactions are all-time high. That means more end users are buying. That's not speculative. That is actually a sign of maturing uh, market. Um, yes, there is, there's always been speculation. You know, uh, the way it's still developing. So there's two very key market segments. There is the ready market, which is the ready stock that you can buy today. And there's the off-plan uh, market, which is new projects being launched and so forth. And that's where there is a little bit of a speculation in that space, but you have to be careful in terms of what your intentions are for investing and so forth, you know, good master developers and so forth. But a little bit of speculation, et cetera, won't hurt. The, uh, well, it's not the majority of the market anymore uh, because, um, you know, uh, you, you're seeing all these uh, trends that I spoke about that are attracting, uh, you know, real tangible value over here. The other element also you have to understand is majority, uh, you know, historically it's a, it is an investor-driven market. Um, cash transactions still make up uh, um, uh, a majority of, of, of the real estate transactions. And when I say cash, I mean, you know, not through mortgages, which means, you know, this market is not susceptible to high interest rates. Uh, and we haven't noticed that either, right? Market has been up, even though the interest rates have been up. Uh, people have, been, have more disposable income over here. So affordability is much higher here compared to back home. And, uh, you know, you know, if I were to go in downtown today and try to buy a two-bedroom condo, uh, I don't know. I haven't looked at the market for a while, but I'm assuming it's going to cost more than a million dollars, right? Yeah. Uh, or a lot more than that, right? Yeah. You can probably do much better than that in the way downtown, right? For mm -hmm. a really nice Right. So when you talk about uh, expensive and so forth, yeah, by historical standards, yes. But from a relative perspective, it's dirt cheap. Right. Uh, especially when you start comparing yeah. to places like Hong Kong, Singapore, London and so forth. And the quality of life is, you know, uh, I would say second to, to none. There is the luxury segment, ultra luxury. A lot of capital came here because of some, you know, uh, obviously political situations, Ukraine and so forth. But, you know, it's, it's all headlines. You know, five, four, five years ago, the headlines were supply demand. Uh, you know, now the headlines were like Russian money, Russian money. You know, would you be surprised if I told you uh, Russians are number seven on the nationalities buying properties in Dubai? Right? Wow. Number seven, number seven right? Uh, number one is British. Uh, wow. Number two is Indians and Pakistanis, Emiratis. Um, and uh, I forget the other one. But Russia is not in the top three, right? So yeah. that gives you a sense. Uh, if no. It's not all Russian money that is over here. Very interesting. Can I ask you, there's a question from uh, Gioti Shamnani, who says, uh, Canadians buy properties using mortgages, which is almost impossible for non-UA residents. Uh, what is your say about this, about it? Is mortgage a possibility for non-UA investors? Uh, it, is, it, is, yeah, it is possible. It's not that easy. Uh, if you guys, if anyone is interested in, in acquiring any assets, uh, either... Um, through mortgages or looking for, you know, uh, uh, reasonable uh, players to work with, et cetera, reach out to me. You can send me an email at uh, Sadiq, S-I-D-D-I-Q, at smartcard.ae. Um, or you can check out our, 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 our platform, smartcard.ae. You know, the idea of the platform is to get people to start with a small amount of money, get comfortable before you're ready to plunge and buy properties yourself. You can check that out. Sorry for the plug-in oh, uh, over here. Um, but, you know, reach out to us. It's, it is possible to get mortgages. Banking over here is not very easy. Uh, uh, you know, one uh, one area where they need to make a lot of improvements is opening up bank accounts. Uh, yeah. it, it, is a pain. It, it is a massive pain. Uh, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. As individuals, it's difficult. For businesses, even more difficult, right? I know, I know lots of entrepreneurs that have to spend like three months, four months 
before a bank account uh, uh, was open. So it, it is it is not that easy, uh, uh, you know, because most of the mortgages over here, it's very difficult, very different, right? Like in, in Canada, you have proper, proper credit, credit ratings, et cetera. Over here, most of the mortgages are given on the back of your what your salary is or personal collateral and so forth, personal guarantees. So it's possible, but it just takes a little bit of time and you should provide a lot of paperwork and so forth. But right. it is too. Thank you so much, Tadeek. I really appreciate your insights. This was very valuable, I think, for the audience uh, to hear your thoughts, especially about the speculation versus end user, because that's a major topic of discussion, as you know, in Dubai. So uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, interestingly, we have a question from the audience that takes us to our next speaker. And the question is the following. Um, uh, it looks like it's disappeared now, oddly. No, there it is. Uh, please let us know, uh, please let us know status of real estate market in Ontario, Canada. And for us to know about Ontario, Canada, uh, Toronto, uh, the mortgage market, the real estate market, we will go to our next speaker, uh, which is, and thank you very much, Sadiq, which is Scott Nazareth. Yes, please yeah. go ahead, Scott. Just before Scott, uh, uh, I just have a present for all my fellow Canadians over here. Uh, if you are interested in using our platform, you can register and we have a promo code. It's called Canadian with a capital C and uh, you, you get 2% cash back for using our platform for the first time. So if anyone's interested, and like I said, my email address is Sadiq uh, at smartcard.e. Uh, feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you so much. This was great. Happy to come back if any people have more questions. And Thank you very much, time. Sadiq. Thank Re you. Really appreciate that. Um, so now moving our focus to the Canadian real estate landscape as, <coughs> excuse me, pursuing a question that's been asked. Our second speaker is Mr. Scott Nazareth. He is an experienced mortgage agent uh, at Mortgages Canada. And to tell you uh, a little bit more about Scott, uh, he's a mortgage in industry professional. As I said, he's a mortgage agent in mortgages.ca. Scott Nazareth has been recognized as one of uh, the Canadian mortgage industry's most promising young stars by being listed in the 2017 edition of Canadian Mortgage Professionals Young Guns. He graduated from the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Uh, welcome, Scott. Uh, welcome to uh, to the seminar and thank you for your time. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Shra, and I'm uh, very happy to be here. As you can tell by the uh, the sweater, I am definitely in Canada, and it is definitely not the same weather as in uh, the UAE. So we'll try to keep it as uh, headlines as possible. As I know, we're limited in time, but for anyone to uh, follow up, just feel free. Uh, more than happy to start conversations and uh, make connections. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and share my uh, presentation here. Um, and let's see if we can get that up. Okay, let's just click view. And uh, do we have this uh, available for everyone to see? Okay. Yes, so, we can. We can. Perfect. So this scary graph that you'll see uh, right in front of you kind of starts off the picture on the landscape uh, for the last 18 months. So to take you back on the uh, right side in 2021, we're talking about uh, COVID-19 starting in 2020, March, leading up to 2021. Of course, interest rates went to emergency lows. Lowest I've ever seen, lowest I may ever see. Um, and it's just a recap, something I put on my desk, just as a reminder, five-year fixed at that time was 1.5%. And the variable rate was 0.99%, less than one percentage point. Uh, and if you'll look at the rise in interest rates, as many clients have felt that personally, if they took a variable or they're up for renewal or they're new in the market, We've seen uh, from April 2022 up until now, interest rates climbing from a low of 0.25%, the overnight lending rate from the Bank of Canada, all the way to where it sits now at 5%. So current interest rates today um, are you know, somewhere around 5.24 to 5.5% for a five-year fix and 6.3% variable. So... 
uh, you would normally expect with such a meteoric rise in interest rates that the market would have the opposite effect where interest rates go up, prices go down. We haven't seen that exactly. Uh, the Toronto real estate market specifically, but other metropolitans similar uh, like Vancouver have stayed relatively resilient. Uh, so while there is uh, definitely a lot of pain in the economy, we've seen GDP contract. Uh, we've seen unemployment numbers go up. There is so much demand for uh, Canadian real estate that it's really put a floor on pricing. Uh, the other thing that aside from real estate impacts uh, mortgage borrowers, both prospective and current, are mortgage rule changes. So in Canada, we've seen a plethora of mortgage rule changes and working with a professional allows you to navigate the red tape, so to speak, uh, which is quite often, uh, uh, quite often revised year after year after year. Uh, and it makes it a little difficult uh, to say the least for people who are purchasing properties. So here's just a, a quick graph to outline some of the changes that have occurred in the Canadian uh, mortgage market. Um, just gonna highlight a few. So the max amortization at one point was 35 years, 5% down payment. Um, that has now shortened to where it currently is at 30 years of an amortization. So of course, the shorter the amortization, the higher the payments, the more uh, difficult it is to qualify. 20% uh, down implemented for rental properties. Prior to 2010, uh, you could actually purchase a rental property for less than 20% down. I'm not too sure if that was ever the case in the uh, UAE. Uh, the max amortization shortened to 25 years was specific for people purchasing with less than 20% down, um, usually first time home buyers. But if you are uh, an investor or you're purchasing a property with more than 20% down, you can still use a 30 year amortization. Um, and then of course, most recently the stress test, which is uh, <laughs> uh, something that's really taken the winds out of uh, the real estate sales in, in, in a lot of uh, smaller pockets in Canada where wage growth has not kept up with uh, the meteoric rise in home prices. Uh, but essentially, the stress test is a buffer uh, rate that's added to your contract rate. So let's say you go into a bank um, or a mortgage professional like myself, and the current rate is 5.25%. Well, with the stress test uh, that was implemented to you know, make sure that people can afford uh, their property if rates go up. And I guess now uh, we know that it was good that they implemented this. They add an additional 2% uh, to your contract rate. So that 5.25% becomes a qualifying rate at 7.25%. So if your monthly payment at 5.25 is $2,500, the bank will see, can you service that debt at 7.25%, which might be $2,800. So it's important to note that working with a professional um, is very important. It, you know, years, years ago, you would basically be able to uh, come in to an institution with 20% down, no questions asked. Uh, those days are long gone. It's a little more complicated than that now, uh, but with a lot of uh, regulation, a lot of barriers to entries um, and uh, the amount of demand, there are a lot of opportunities. So first time home buyers, uh, especially, you know, they are somewhat getting priced out of the market. Um, as I mentioned before, wage growth is not keeping up with the uh, uh, rising price of real estate. And that's a, a big silver lining uh, for people who are choosing to invest in Canada. We're going to probably face a generation of renters coming up. I, I, I know the uh, people in Gen X, uh, I'm a millennial, so I don't fall into that category, but people in Gen X might be uh, a little bit upset um, in hearing that. But the sad reality is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of money coming into Canada and there are uh, a lot of people who through generational wealth transfers, uh, whether through inheritance, the sale of uh, property, um, will be transferring over all of that capital that's been accumulated through uh, capital appreciation over many years. Uh, and that's just going to further fuel 
um, more and more price growth. Now, in, in the news, you'll, you'll often hear that the reason for the price growth, of course, is uh, because supply is really constrained and, uh, uh, in recent headlines. Uh, the government of Canada has set a quota of 500,000 immigrants per year. And that number can increase depending on the situation. Um, but we have always been a uh, country that survives and thrives with uh, a, a free flow of immigrants coming to the country. And uh, that's really put a floor on uh, where prices can, uh, can drop even during turbulent times. Just gonna, so now what are the silver linings here? Um, you know, relatively speaking, uh, if you have, you know, a, a, a pretty, uh, a pretty low debt load, it's still somewhat affordable. So if you were to say, for example, borrow a hundred thousand um, dollars on a home equity line of credit, uh, which is a revolving credit line, um, it would be $625 a month interest only. On a mortgage, that would be about $550 a month. So that can give you a good idea, you know, extrapolate that to 500K to a million uh, with these figures uh, per 100K. And you can kind of understand where you would fit um, if you were to qualify for a mortgage in Canada. Um, again, home equity loans versus uh, HELOC. So of course, uh, with a line of credit, it acts as a revolving credit facility. You can choose to uh, pay it off at any time. You can choose to advance the funds at any time. Uh, you can pay it off um, at any time. And with a mortgage, it's a fixed term. So in Canada, we have terms from one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, seven year, and 10 year. So different from the US where you have 15 year and 30 year loans here, you're up for renewal, typically every three to five years. So you're not locked in. Um, here we have kind of a mantra, you know, you uh, date the rate and you marry the house. Um, and that's because, you know, they do not lock you into very long contracts. And that allows you to sort of play the market. Um, of course, it's worked in a declining interest rate uh, market where, you know, rates have uh, traditionally just gone down, uh, where rates have gone up, we are seeing, you know, a little bit of uh, turbulence. Uh, but uh, we do hope that we are at the end of the rate cycle um, and uh, all of the headlines from both the Bank of Canada, as well as the Federal uh, Reserve in the US has indicated that uh, inflation is coming down, um, which is a great indicator. And then of course, GDP is contracting. So I think we are finally in a recession. Um, and uh, that usually indicates that we're not too far off from rate cuts. Um, opportunities. so. Again, international uh, immigration is at an all-time high. Um, during the pandemic, of course, if you look at uh, the, the latter part of the uh, the graph here, you'll see that you know there was a spike. That's typically because of the fact that borders were closed, so there was a buildup of that quota, buildup of that application process. Um, so you'll see a spike. But from that 800k number, uh, we're kind of sitting at um, about 500k per year for the next three years. And, uh, you know, we're uh, definitely focused on bringing in quality uh, candidates each and every year. Um, and as far as opportunity, so for you guys looking at, you know, what is an opportunity um, for you to invest specifically in Ontario for this graph? Um, transit. So I'm sure it's the same thing in Dubai. Uh, high quality public transit allows people to connect and bridge the gap from cities on the periphery of a major metropolitan like Toronto. Uh, right to downtown Toronto. So you can see as far east as Oshawa um, or, you know, as far as far west as uh, as Hamilton. Um, all of those areas are connected through the GO train system um, and that will bring you in and out of the city. Of course, uh, you know, work from home and uh, being able to work remotely has been great. But so far, uh, we've seen that trend sort of reverse. So we are expecting people to start coming back into the office. It's probably going to change the landscape uh, a little bit for how far people move from their place of work. Um, so this graph kind of gives you, uh, or this map kind of gives you a good idea of areas um, that will be developed, that are being developed, um, that have universities um, attached to them to, uh, you know, make sure that population grows um, in the outskirts of Toronto.
So, and just a little bit about mortgages.ca. So top three mortgage brokerages in Canada, uh, established in 2012, located downtown Toronto, uh, won numerous awards. We're not ones to, uh, you know, display too many accolades, uh, but uh, we do have quite a few. And uh, one of the big differences is that we're not just a single one man operation. Uh, we actually do have full-time underwriting staff um, that helps us ensure that you are fully prepared to make an offer. Uh, we, we take a look at your individual case in the event that you, for example, are a non-resident. Um, we have specific non-resident programs. Uh, we work with clients all across the globe and we will essentially vet the process, give you an idea of how much you can qualify for based on your income. Um, and then from there, you can feel free to put a offer on a property and we can guide you through the process uh, with either one of the major banks or credit unions. So happy to answer any questions, uh, sure I am from there, but uh, thank try you. To as you so headlines as possible. <laughs> yeah, very informative. And uh, thank you for taking us through the Canadian market. Certainly. Uh, very informative for us sitting here as Canadians uh, and not in Canada. It, it's great to see uh, and have that information. I appreciate it. I, I have two questions uh, to ask you. Thank you for all that. Uh, the first question, I think, uh, is a continuation to what you were saying. So, uh, you know, wh why should we be looking at a mortgage broker versus just doing it ourselves uh, directly? Tell us about that one, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I'll try to keep this one brief. Uh, so when you go into a, a car dealership, uh, like a Honda, they can only offer you, you know, Hondas. When you work with a mortgage broker, uh, we offer you uh, options from over 40 different lenders. So yeah. access is key. And then with that access comes the expertise of knowing the products in and out from multiple institutions. Um, so that really gives you a, an edge um, and to, you know, sort of dub ourselves professional mortgage shoppers. So we, we shop for you professionally. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. As I'm asking this question, uh, one of our audience members has asked you to roll back to the train map and then forward because for some reason they couldn't see that. Yeah. So they can just have a look. And um, to this one and then the, the next slides, will just let you go through that when you're ready. And, and I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, why was the var variable rate at 6%, uh, which was higher than the fixed rate of 5%? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. The um, spread typically between fixed and variable um, has, used, has traditionally um, uh, been, a, been in reverse, where the variable would be lower than the fixed rate. Um, but the variable is based on the prime lending rate, which is directly impacted by the Bank of Canada. So in the last 18 months, we've seen the overnight lending rate increase from 0.25 all the way to 5% in a span of 18 months. So that's not happened before. Um, Canadian five-year fixed rates are based on the Canadian five-year bond yield. So currently, uh, we've seen a dip in fixed rates. They peaked at around 6% um, and they have come down. And usually when interest rates come down for the bond yields, um, that indicates that we are closer to a potential rate cut. So think of the five-year fixed rate as forward looking um, and think of the variable rate as a current snapshot on where interest rates are. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I think with that, uh, our time has run out. I want to thank you very much, Scott, for uh, this uh, excellent presentation. It certainly gives us a feel for what's going on on the mortgage side as well as the market in Canada. Thank you, Scott. No worries. Anytime. Okay. With that, uh, let, yep, Dana. Yep, good. Uh, I'm good. So that all our people to make sure that they'll get information from each one of our speakers at the very end in the follow-up emails. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. With that, uh, that takes us to uh, our last speaker.
uh, Mr. Uh, Wayne Bewick, who some of you may know from before. He's been, uh, we've had the good fortune of having him speak for many years in Dubai. Um, and uh, Wayne uh, has given various tax, uh, uh, Wayne is an experienced uh, Canadian Charter Professional Accountant. He's the owner, managing director uh, of private client individual services, Trowbridge Professional Corporation in Canada. He's a certified financial planner and a U.S. certified public accountant. Wayne leads the private client division at Trowbridge and thrives on problem solving and making complex tax matters less daunting for his international clients. Wayne joined Trowbridge in 2002 with a vision to give the firm a global platform by educating and advising expats on their personal tax needs. Wayne is frequently sought, sought out as a panelist and subject matter expert present, presenting worldwide on tax compliance issues, tax obligations for expats living and working abroad. Prior to joining Trowbridge, Wayne spent time at Deloitte, specializing in expat and international tax services. Wayne graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce from Concordia uh, and has completed levels one and two of the Canadian Institute of Chartered Accounts in-depth taxation program. Wayne, welcome. Thanks, John. Good to, good to be here. Yeah, good to see you. So yeah. tell us about uh, what is going on in the world of tax and what people should think about, please. Yeah, so it's an incredibly interesting time in uh, in real estate tax for Canadians. Um, uh, housing affordability is probably right now the top political issue, I would say, in uh, in Canada. And there's been so many different rules and everything put in to try to to try to manage that. So. Um, so, you know, and it's not only uh, federally, it's also provincially and then city-wise. <clears throat> so Toronto just increased their um, underused housing tax uh, or vacant home tax to 3%. So oh. if, if, if you have a vacant home in Toronto, uh, you pay 3%. So if you have a million dollar home, you're paying, you know, $30,000 on, on that. So uh you know that's and that's happening everywhere so that's vancouver has that as well and yeah. and it's spreading um uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion around a lot of these rules as well so for example they just brought in the underused housing tax rule uh which is a one percent tax um but that doesn't apply to citizens like canadian prs or canadian citizens but everyone was so confused the original deadline to, to do this was April 30th of 2023. Then they the CRA extended it to uh, October 30th and now till April 30th of 2024. Like they extended the deadline a whole year because of the confusion around the underused housing tax. So yeah, so all the new taxes that are coming in are confusing. And again, they're all about trying to get, um, you know, people to, to rent out their homes uh, and not keep homes empty, so. Yeah. And so, you know, given given all these tax changes, Wayne, uh, on owning properties, you know, I mean, it, increasingly more difficult, more laborious, uh, more conditions. Uh, does it still make sense from a tax perspective for people to buy properties in Canada? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it does, uh, you know, as long as you're not keeping them vacant. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so. The, the capital gains rates for non-residents, they're actually quite low. Um, you know, so say you're to buy a house for a million dollars and you sell it for 1.5 and there's a, a $500,000 gain, only half that gain is actually taxable. So you only pay tax on 250,000. And if you have, if, as a non-resident, because you have no other income, you're, you start at the lowest tax brackets. So the, you know, the tax on that might be I don't know, say seventy thousand, but on a five hundred thousand dollar gain, that's 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 really not that much. So, interesting. So I think, so I think again, it it does make sense. It's just you really need to make sure you don't get hit with one of these really really punitive penalties uh, of keeping the house vacant. So yeah. Um, sorry, this reminds me of a separate topic, and it's not really tax related, but but curious. Um, excuse me, allergies. Um as to the restriction on foreigners buying property in, um, is it province-wide, is it federal? How does that work? Yeah, so that's another one that, again, I always say that's that's kind of a misnomer. It's called like the non-resident surtax, but you can be a Canadian non-resident, you don't have to pay it. 
so it's not even they haven't even named it properly um, uh, yeah but that's in certain provinces so uh or certain uh areas like in the, the golden horseshoe or whatever of uh near toronto you know you can pay 20 percent outside of vancouver and those areas so it's very limited right now to where it is i think uh, halifax now has a five percent one as well so it depends on the area um but again if you're a canadian you're not subject to those rules um, although the Halifax one you are, but the others you aren't. So um, that's another not, one. Yeah. It, I'm sorry. It's not a prohibition. It's a, just a tax. It's a surtax. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a tax of, uh, that you're paying. So, um, but for non Canadians, I mean, that's a, that is a big tax when you're paying 20% or around the, on the, on the, the purchase price. Right. So, um, yeah. Um, so back to our discussion on buying a property, I'm, I'm Canadian. Uh, I've been away for a while. I'm non-resident. I'm going to buy a property there. Can that potentially jeopardize uh, that Canadian's non-residency status? H how's that going to work if I if I buy a property in Canada? Yeah, so I mean that's a great question because uh, residency is for tax purposes is is the key thing. It's one of the, it's one of the, the reasons I love presenting in in Dubai and the UAE because there's still no tax there. I mean they started the corporate tax, <clears throat> started the like the VAT tax, so. We'll see what happens. But if you're a resident of Canada for tax purposes, you pay tax on your worldwide income, which could be as high as 53%. But if you're a non-resident, then you don't pay tax in Canada. And having a home available is the, like there's three big ties to Canada for tax purposes and having a home is one of the biggest ties. But if it's rented out uh, and then it's not considered available for use, you don't have to worry about it. So, mm -hmm. So we would typically recommend to rent it out. If it's a cottage and it's only available for certain months of the year, that's different. Um, but typically you'd want to rent it out. So Yeah, understood. Um, and then the next question was uh, rental income. So obviously you'd, you'd buy the house and you want to rent it out. So for those considering rental income, is renting out a property a wise decision from a taxation standpoint, Wayne? Yeah, it's really not a big deal. I mean, you, you have to file again because you 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 have Canadian income. Mm -hmm. um, so you file a special tax return. It's called a 216 return. But on that return, all you're putting is just the rental income. And, you know, you can write up all your expenses, the mortgage interest, property taxes. So a lot of times there, there really isn't that much net income. And then you're taxed at the lowest rate again. So you're at around 20% tax bracket. So... So, you know, you just have to make sure you do things properly. The thing yes. is, if you don't do things properly, uh, you can get yourself in trouble, as you can imagine. So, you know, for example, if you're renting out your property for like 2000 a month, if you don't do things properly, you can be hit by with a 25% penalty of the gross rent. Um, mm. So just like anything, there's, you know, it, it's the Canadian way, I think, just tax everything and, and, and a lot of rules. And, uh, you know, so you just have to make sure you're doing it properly. And, and you know, you're speaking with people that that understand it. So. Sure. So. I, I remember when a couple of years ago, <clears throat> there was this rumor circulating um, about a wealth tax for mm -hmm. and they're, they're looking for a wealth tax. And they thought, you know, uh, probably the the lowest, uh, you know, fruit that they could grab would be the non-resident Canadians. Has that gone anywhere? Was that a real discussion? What's 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 the story on that one? Yeah, so that hasn't gone anywhere. I mean, that's always interesting. So we do a lot of U.S. tax, and so if you're a U.S. citizen, so say you were born in the U.S. and you moved out when you were two years old, you would still have to, and you've never went back, you would still have to file every year. Just wow. that's how U.S. citizens. There, there are there have been murmurs around that about from Canada, but I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, there's only two okay. countries that do that, so I, I really don't think it's going to happen. I mean, it'd be great for our business, but uh, I don't think it'd be, <laughs> I don't think it'd be good for Canadians that uh, that live around the world that that aren't paying tax now. So, so I think yeah. that I think that's fine. So, great, great, um, fantastic. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all your time on taxation. If the audience has any questions on tax, this is your chance. Wayne is here uh, for yeah. a very limited time. So let I'll be, us yeah, I think, uh, I think I'll be there in person in September. So what I love, the, the thing about Dubai, what I love is, so I first met Sangeeta in 2007 and I presented every year since, except for 2020 during COVID. And the thing about Dubai is when you go once a year, 
the difference is, you know, especially back in the early years are amazing. Like the, you know, how things grow and, you know. So. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's, it's tremendous. And in the past six years, Dubai's just gone through the roof as far as development and uh, traffic yeah. as well as, as uh, was mentioned yeah. by. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, very good. We, we hope to see you in September when you come. I'd encourage the audience to attend. Uh, Wayne's seminars are always excellent. So uh, we look forward to seeing you then, Wayne. Um, so thank you uh, to everyone. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, anything else we, we should know about Wayne that you'd like to share with us? Um, <clears throat> yeah, just to try to, uh, <clears throat> so even now, like even Airbnb in certain places, like expenses are not gonna be allowed. So I think it's just making sure you're staying abreast of all the changes that are going on if you wanna buy um, the property. Okay, but but again, yeah, it's not it's not a problem. It's just navigating the uh, the issues. So, and I think I think Canada is going to do well in the future. And I think so. I think it's I think it's good. So. Thank you so much, Ryan. Really appreciate your insights as always, uh, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, very much uh, Sadiq, Scott, and Wayne for sharing uh, their insights uh, on the latest real estate trends in Canada and the UAE. As we navigate the complexities of these markets, it is evident that strategic knowledge, informed decision-making are paramount and professional advice from uh, tax advisors, uh, brokers, and the platforms that we've seen. Uh, in conclusion, I urge each of you to consider these perspectives carefully uh, for in the world of real estate, the landscape is not only about bricks and mortar, but it is about the strategic choices that shape our financial future. Thank you to our esteemed speakers and our distinguished audience for your, your presence tonight. And we wish you all the best. Thank you.